Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Speaking about uh, economically motivated subjects and uh, companies at the forefront, as the professor said, uh, here we are. Uh, thanks, uh, Commander uh, Miglietta, and uh, good morning to the many friends uh, in the audience. Uh, thanks, uh, thank you, Professor Di Corinto. I haven't said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Santagra, I haven't said that your uh, speech is about prevention, detection, and reaction of cyber attacks to critical infrastructures. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So the perimeter of uh, a critical infrastructure in the last few years has expanded uh, enormously. Uh, we used to think of critical infrastructure uh, about uh, uh, entities such as ministries, for example, ministries of defense, or uh, critical infrastructure such as railways, uh, electric grids, and so on. Uh, today is also a private company is a critical infrastructure for the very reason that was raised by Professor Zanero right uh, before, because uh, oftentimes, the private companies are those that uh, uh, master the technology that is more and more in use in the uh, cyber arena. Now, uh, there was a time uh, a few years back when uh, we were all saying that we needed laws, we needed procedures because there was a confusion about who does what, who's responsible for what, what happens in case of an attack to a critical infrastructure. Uh, Professor uh, Baldoni outlined the current uh, perimeter of uh, the cybersecurity in Italy. So I may say from our privileged standpoint as private company that a lot has been done in terms of laws and uh, procedures. Uh, there is still something missing and uh, that is uh, uh, very strictly correlated to, in my view, uh, and not only in my view, is needed to win uh, cyber war, which is technology. Uh, something is changing also in the industrial landscape in Italy about this, but we can still think about the fact that uh, uh, 80% of the industrial players, private companies who uh, operate in the cyber arena in Italy, basically sell services. Only 20% produce uh, technology. This is to say what? That in order to be an effective um, player in terms of contribution to uh, uh, general uh, cybersecurity overall system, uh, technology is key and becomes more and more critical. When I say technology, of course, uh, I'm not talking specifically about uh, the old way of thinking about technology, such as hardware based and so on. Today, uh, know how is a form of technology. A lot has been said also about vulnerability. When I talk about technology, I mean specifically the knowledge about vulnerability and the software that enables either to exploit those vulnerabilities or to fix those uh, vulnerabilities. In this respect, things are changing, but we're still uh, going probably too slow. One of uh, the signs that things are changing is the increasing number of M&A, mergers and acquisitions uh, operations going on. This will create more critical mass, meaning companies buying other companies or merging with other companies. This is key in order to create a critical mass that uh, we're still uh, uh, missing in uh, in our country. Probably in two, three years, that we also uh, see a substantial change in this respect. All this will have a positive impact in protecting a uh, critical infrastructure. Next, please. 
Why is that? Because uh, if it is true, as I said, that the critical infrastructure is not only what we used to believe to be a critical infrastructure, but it's also a company like Cyphergate, for example, or one of the many private players that uh, develops and produces proprietary technology in order to secure a governmental or a state-owned critical infrastructure, well, then everything revolves around technology. Uh, we used to say, when I was in the military, for example, that uh, the three basic elements to win a war are money, money, and money. Well, that's an exaggeration, of course, but for the first time, when it comes to cyber war, money is not necessarily the primary and most fundamental element. Think about the cost of a jet, of a fighter jet, for example, or an artillery piece. And think about the amount of things that you can do in the cyber arena with that same amount of money. There is uh, an, an interesting ratio in this respect that uh, can generate interesting considerations. Next. So uh, technology, of course, is a, a great enabler, but it must be proprietary. Now, that's another key issue. Uh, if we think about NATO as a complex organization, and uh, we take US out of the equation, and so we concentrate on continental Europe, then we see that uh, there is an issue of uh, proprietary technology. There is an issue of uh, digital sovereignty that will be more and more a hot issue. We have taken care of laws, as we have uh, uh, heard of procedures, there is more, definitely more clarity about responsibilities. Uh, a lot to do in terms of uh, uh, digital sovereignty. Being able to master a certain type of technology is key also because NATO is made of many sovereign nations. And as it has been said, uh, it is up to the nations in many, many cases to drive a certain contribution well, if technology is not proprietary, there's going to be a structural weakness that sooner or later will uh, uh, backfire. Uh, we are, uh, in this uh, respect, uh, at the forefront of developing and uh, mastering our own technologies, and so are doing many other players, uh, but still not enough. So technology must be sovereign and proprietary. Next. This will contribute uh, to uh, a better cyber strategy overall. Uh, and we're seeing these uh, effects because we are partners and uh, suppliers of both governments. So security uh, entities of government, armed forces, intelligence agencies, poli police forces, as well as uh, uh, companies. And one key effect of uh, being able to uh, have uh, um, the control of the source code chain, for example, or of the knowledge of vulnerabilities, is that one thing will go up, the capability to be more resilient. Now, there is this concept of cyber resilience, which is more and more taking pace within the private environment that is actually taken uh, uh, from the military uh, world. Uh, Resilience is all about uh, trying to accept the maximum level of damage below which the functionality, the structural, the structural functionality of a system is compromised, which is something that private companies uh, are borrowing from uh, uh, the military world. Well, that is key in order to secure critical infrastructures, whatever they are, in a resilient manner, you need proprietary uh, technology and shift away from the paradigm that uh, you have to create a, a big Chinese wall in order to prevent anybody from coming in. That's impossible. That's not gonna happen. Sooner or later, somebody will attack and will be successful. You have to play with it exactly as it happens 
uh, in uh, uh, military uh, operations and military uh, exercises. Uh, next, together with this concept of cyber resilience, if you master and uh, possess the keys to knowledge in terms specifically of vulnerabilities, you can, in addition to uh, resilience, talk also about deterrence. And in my view, this is the second the missing pillar of uh, uh, many, I would say, continental Europe national cyber strategy, the capability to retaliate, the capability to put in place offensive operations. Now, I'm not going to delve into uh, the discussion of whether we can or we cannot from a legal standpoint. All I'm saying is that uh, I have heard uh, speakers saying that many companies, many private companies uh, possess key technologies and that is uh, something uh, economically motivated. And sometimes since uh, uh, costs are the main drivers for uh, private company strategies, that could be a liability in terms of being an effective private player. Well, let's not forget that missiles, weapons, command and controls, uh, air defense systems, land-based systems are made by private companies, then utilized by governments, that's for sure. But uh, they are developed and manufactured by companies that possess that kind of technology. So I would not be too much worried about the fact that private companies uh, uh, are uh, uh, the owners of key technology utilized for this. The point is that we need in a resolute manner to march towards the capability of being capable each and every NATO nation to put in place uh, retaliation cyber offensive operations. It doesn't mean that it has to be done, but it has to be at least known how to do it and activated according to a very strict command and control protocol. We're still behind all this. There is a lot of talk also within NATO about these subjects, but then again, uh, too much witnessing and too little action. So those are my remarks. Thanks for inviting and I'm uh, willing to address questions if there are.